welcome to Energy Talks, a regular podcast series of expert discussions on power system testing topics. My name is Stefan Achtberger from the podcast team at Omicron, and I will be your host. Hello, everyone. This is the fourth episode of our mini-series called Circuit Breaker Testing Around the World. We want to have expert discussions about what circuit breaker technologies are used, how circuit breakers are tested, and the reasons for these differences all over the world. My name is Stefan, I work at the Omicron headquarters in Klaus, Austria, and I've spent about six years focusing on circuit breaker testing all around Europe. In this episode, I have the honor of talking to Anas Abdulkader from the Middle East. He has experience in power system testing for more than 10 years and is talking to me today from his home office in Dubai. So Anas, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for having me on this Energy Talks about the circuit breaker testing around the world. Honestly, you know, I'm really thrilled and excited to discuss the fascinating world of circuit breakers, specifically in context of Middle East power infrastructure. And honestly, it's an honor to share my expertise and insights on the crucial assets of the electrical system. Awesome. I'm excited to have you here and it's, it's amazing for you to be part on the show. So before we get into the circuit breaker testing, actually, let's talk about you real quick. So what is your background? What kind of education did you have? How did you get into circuit breaker testing? What's your path to leading you to this conversation? Yeah, I have to start from my college background. So I studied BTEC. It's a Bachelor of Technology in Electrical and Electronics. So from the university itself, you know, we are learning a lot onto this high voltage power systems. And the first of its kinds that we are studying is on about the transformers and circuit breakers. So these things are ringing from you know, since that time. And, you know, I don't know, it's a lack or, you know, it's everything is planned. I somehow in, started my first career in, in 110 KV substation as an operation and maintenance engineer, where I got the opportunity to explore, like, you know, these assets in real and also to support the testing of circuit breakers and transformers. So that's how I started my career. And that was in India. So after that, I traveled to Saudi Arabia and I joined one company responsible for the manufacturing of GIS systems up to 380 kV and the transformers up to 380 kV that was normally we used in Saudi Arabia. So I worked as a field service engineer responsible for the installation and commissioning. During that time also, the main focus was, uh, the most part of the my work was on GIS systems. So I do the first operations and support the installations also. And in case of any failures or issues of any components, we have to do the maintenance and replacement of the parts. So I got the opportunity to work on circuit breaker mechanisms during that time for replacement of some complicated and sophisticated parts. And it was very interesting. That's definitely an awesome way to learn, right? Or to really be in that regard to, to actually replace them. Is that something that still helps you today where you can use that knowledge to when you're testing circuit breakers because you know how the, the mechanics works kind of behind the scenes? Exactly, exactly. That's 100% correct, uh, Stefan. It's, you know the, how the things are working and you feel it. The all components. <laughs> so uh, During the testing itself, you know, all these things will... I don't know, it's like a movie in your mind. It reflects on, on your memory and it's help us to connect easily to the results and help us in easy analysis as well. And also you, this you know, adjustments of the, the auxiliary contacts, which isn't connected to the, the main mechanisms. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, and it's very difficult. Even one mm changes inside the mechanism, which completely makes problem in the normal operation. So it was, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. challenging as well as exciting. So this really helped me to improve my knowledge on these systems. And after that, I joined Omicron and it's been more than six years in Omicron. So that in Omicron itself, I've got opportunity to, you know, try it out many manufacturers, such breakers and transformers. You know, it's got the diversity then. And in, in these six, six years, initially, I worked as a primary application engineer. So I mm -hmm. support all the primary systems, including circuit breakers, instrument transformers, power transformers, rotating machines. And I tried my best to travel around and, you know, get opportunity to do some demonstrations, trainings to the customers. 
all this, you know, really helped me to improve myself, gain my experiences and also share knowledge with the other people. So that's what we are doing now. It's awesome. So you have kind of an, an overview on all the primary assets, but from the college, you kind of had also the focus on circuit breaker testing. And then with the very intensive phase where you're actually working in specifically GIS, yeah, testing and repairing and maintenance. So you kind of have all the all the insights there. That's that's an amazing path and, and a lot of knowledge for sure. So before we go into the, the testing of circuit breakers, what I always ask this question, what makes the Middle East kind of unique? Oh, wait, before we get to that, what what kind of area are you active in? Like, do you work all over the Middle East? What, what countries are you working in? Personally, my focus is Middle East and Africa. That's part of our business. And I'm traveling a lot in the Middle East area because that's where we have more inquiries and more businesses and yeah. more diversified assets. And traveling in Middle East is also quite easier. I'm staying in Dubai. So the connectivity yeah. is also very easier. So I can start like this conversation with the term Middle East. Actually, this Middle East term, you know, you have used this also in the beginning. This was originated in actually in 1850 by the British okay. India office. You know, it's interesting. Okay. And, it, and it became widely known when the American naval strategist, Sir Alfred Tyre Mahan, used the term in 1902. To, it's, it's, okay. a, it's an area, it's a designate area between Arabia and India. So that's the Middle East. And it consists of 18 countries. And the biggest country geographically is the Saudi Arabia. So you're all over the Middle East and sometimes a little bit into into Africa. That's kind of yeah. where you're usually working. Cool. Yes. And then learn something about history as well. That's awesome. So then let's continue with, with what makes this area unique in regards to it, its power grid, but specifically to, to circuit breaker requirements. We, I mean, we already talked about GIS and kind of that's my knowledge or maybe less knowledge than kind of my theory of how I imagined that there's a lot of GIS there, but what, what makes it unique and, and why maybe if there are even that many GIS, what, why are there so many GIS? So just tell me a little bit about the background. Why is, is it, is it the way it is? Yeah, sure. It's an interesting factor to know also why there was a lot of GIS. Like I said, when I started in the Middle East, my work, I really surprised like so it's all around is the high voltage systems are GIS, which my experience okay. from India was all in the AIS systems, but was very mm -hmm. progressive here. So when I want to give in more details to that, I would like to also highlight about the, the voltage level distributions in the region. The generation level is 13.8 kV and there are multiple transmission levels like 110 kV, 115 kV, 132 kV. And we have the extra high voltage transmission of 380 kV and 400, 400 kV systems. Also, oh, there is a interconnection between the different countries in GCC. So the GCC is a Gulf Cooperative Council inside the Middle East. It consists of six countries. And there is interconnection between these countries, also the grid connection. And they also use the 200 and 400 kV transmission systems, including the high voltage AC transmission system and high voltage DC, HVDC transmission system. Also, there is, uh, you know, offshore and onshore, in the, you know, customers and distribution systems are there, transmission systems are there. We also use the, the submarine cable transmission. And also, I want to highlight that in Middle East, we have the fourth biggest solar farm, which is located in Dubai, in UAE. So just the thing I want to highlight is that there is a rapid growth and urbanization was witnessed in several countries within the region. This rapid growth and expansion and the construction market, including both commercial and residential buildings. And we have one of the biggest smart city in the world now being constructed in Saudi Arabia, NEO. So this kind of growth has led to a significant increase in power demand, necessitating the installation of new power generation facilities transmission systems and distribution networks also. You know that the Middle East has the kind of extreme climatic conditions. And in many parts of the Middle East, we have very high temperature, sandstorm and humidity. Stefan, what's the temperature there now? I think we have about 15 degrees today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a winter for us. <laughs> That's winter as well. <laughs> yes, the temperature here can rise more than 50 degrees Celsius. We have some demonstration in the sites 
remote locations, especially in, in the middle of the desert. You can see the transformer winding temperature indicator shows very high, more than 50, 60 and all. It's, it's under shutdown condition, not in the operational condition. So let's go to very wow. high temperature. And not just that, we have a lot of sandstorms time to time and also the humidity. Yes, in, in yeah. some months, the humidity is quite high. So these harsh environmental conditions pose challenges for a reliable operation of electric yeah. equipment, including the circuit breaker. So this kind of, you know, this rapid growth in the infrastructure and the harsh environmental condition, you know, often make the requirement to have a system that can resist such heat, dust, and moisture to ensure a proper performance and longevity. So as a result, Middle East requires a robust and reliable circuit breaker capable of handling high voltage, medium voltage levels. So we have starting from low voltage, then medium voltage, high voltage, capable of interrupting large fault currents. So now that's why these are the some of the reasons that the Middle East focus to a GI system. But you know that in the GI system, you don't need a lot of space it is in a one building inside the building, which is these days air conditioned and very secured. So which really improves the reliability of the operation of the power systems. Very interesting. So it's not necessarily in Europe and, and I think around the world, it's mostly it's because of space requirements, like especially in cities, you can't yeah. put a huge air insulated switch gear. It's just not feasible. So you need the small and compact. But so in the Middle East, it's more due to weather conditions in, in order to end sandstorms. Well, it's also weather condition, but temperature and, and sandstorms, etc. Because so you need to, to insulate. But maybe a funny question, but if afterwards you build a building anyways, where you put the GIS inside, why do you need the GIS inside if it's, anyways, if you put a building around it, can you put a, an AIS inside the building? If you build a uh, building anyways above it? That's a quite interesting uh, question. You know that for the GIS, it's very compact. Yeah. Um, it is, all the system is inside the SF6 gas and the properties of the SF6 gas is it's very highly electronegative and it's a very, having very good, the insulation property. Unlike the AIS systems, it's having the air insulated substation. So the limitations that we face to keep inside a building, it's, it's, I don't know if it will be possible or not. The yeah, end, you would have to have a much larger building again. No, so yeah, it building. kind of comes down to space requirement. True. True. <laughs> and, and like I said, these days, you know, here, like in the Europe and other countries, there's a, the urbanization is going a lot. And so again, the space is also definitely one factor. So we yeah. need some such as, you know, smart, compact and reliable systems. So the GIS is a perfect solution for that. Maybe a dumb question, but do you have any GIS switch gears outdoors? So without a, a building covering it? Not really. I have seen some stations like, you know, like a mobile stations okay. and also uh, the GIBs, which is taking, bringing out to the yard. These are general, what we have seen it, but as in as a as the, with the whole system, I have not seen something outside the building. Okay, no, just yeah. just interested, you know. What, what how would you describe the percentage of of substations that are built in GAS style? Is it almost a hundred percent? Is it three quarters? Like, what would you what would you guess is the the number or the percentage of of guest substations in GAS mode? So in, in the GCC countries, so Middle East has, like I said, 18, 18 countries, which is incorporating the Middle East. In GCC, yeah. I can say 95 or 98 percentage of the GIS systems. There are some old stations, which is still running in some regions of the GCC countries, are still AIS. So I can say that this, this 2% or 3% for that thing. But in talking about the Middle East, which also have the Iraq, Iran, and Egypt. So Egypt is in Africa, Iraq, Iran, and Jordan, these countries. So those countries are still having a lot of air insulated substations, even though the, uh, the temperature in, in Iraq are higher, but in Jordan, temperatures are not that high. But the, the, compared to the GCC countries, the urbanizations are not that as faster in those countries. Yep. So I see. Yeah, so the GCC, that's one of the reasons that has like main most of them are the GIS and all of the new stations are GIS. 
Okay. Yeah, that would, would have been one of my next questions. So everything new is definitely GIS. When you go back to the to the stuff that's still old and still there from from history, let's say, what kind of circuit breakers are used there? Is it still oil or were they already SF6 or? So historically, various types of circuit breakers have been used in the Middle East, including the ACBs, air circuit breakers, oil circuit breakers, and there's some SF6 breakers. ACBs okay. were commonly used for the low voltage applications, while OCBs were employed for the medium to high voltage applications. And I remember in eastern Saudi Arabia, I visited one old substation which was built around 1980s. If I'm not wrong, it was seven, eight years before. It was in the middle of the desert again. It was a remote location. I saw a dead tank circuit breaker. Okay. It was really surprising to me. And that was my first time to see a dead tank breaker. I have seen a lot of live tank breakers during my career. But that was my first time to see a dead tank breaker and it was in Saudi Arabia. So it was surprising okay. to me. <laughs> but however, due to the advancements in technology and need for more efficient environmental friendly solution, you know, the usage of these older types of circuit breakers has decreased significantly. So today, Middle East, like many other regions, uses VCBs. To, and to a growing extent, now we have the GIS circuit breakers. And, and if I... You now talk more into the you know what we are using it today. The VCBs are commonly used for the medium voltage ranges up to 33 kV. Uh, okay. While GIS systems from 33 kV it is used in the stations in 33 kV are like panels with the GIS. It's, it's, it's like a, not like a normal GIS. It's like panels, and the breakers are using the that technology. And higher voltage definitely it's the GIS systems which we are using. Okay, yeah, that would have been my next question or to, to specify in the medium voltage range again. So there you have gas insulated switch gears, but using vacuum circuit breakers inside of these switch gears and the higher voltage levels, you have complete SF6 switch gears and circuit breakers and everything. Yeah. Okay. Then maybe one last question before we go into the testing of the circuit breakers. How big is the the push towards SF6 alternatives. If you have this many S yeah, GAS breakers and, and switch gears, how is, is there already, are people trying to use SF6 alternatives or are you still kind of mostly focusing on, on, on SF6 as the, as the major gas for even in new substations? Uh, you know, Stefan, the technologies are really welcoming in Middle East. That's what I have seen from my experiences. So these technologies are been trying to introduce and I have seen GE, they have a new type of greenhouse gases, sorry, a new type of green gas. Green gas. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they yeah. have a specific naming for that, but I have not seen it a lot, but I know that if it is established, definitely it will be welcoming in the region. But so far it is all SF6 type GIS and in the region there are a lot of contracts has been ongoing. Most of them, like utilities, purchasing the GIS in bigger, bigger quantities. Like they buy in 100 base, 150 bases, direct purchase contract. So they already have these contracts with the manufacturers. Whenever they need a substation, they just order 10 units, 10 base, 15 base, like that. So, so far, the wow. trend is going with the SF6 gas. SF6, you know, so far it is okay. Even though there is now a lot of studies has been ongoing regarding the pollution that can happen due to SF6 and its the decomposition to SO2. But uh, I don't see a lot of, or I have not here any new stations which is established with the, the new replaced SF6 gas. Okay. But other than now, the digital substation is getting trend. It still uses the GIS system. But it was, which, which is connected with the other sensors and the signals in binary to be transmitted to the room protection or control relays. So this stations has been already now available in some countries of Middle East. Okay. I was recently at an event in Germany where we discussed the SF6 alternatives a lot. And I mean, it's not that here we have a lot of them already. It's all, it's just kind of in the... A little bit be beyond the prototype stage, but you can't have everything in, in SF6 free with styles yet. I was just curious. And I mean, there's every, or 
most bigger manufacturers have some version of SF6 free, SF6 alternative. And I was just curious if you have any in, in your area yet, then maybe it's the trend is might be going into the direction, but so far it's, it's mostly still SF6. So let's go into circuit breaker testing. So what are like the, the, the easiest tests that you usually perform when you go in, into circuit breakers? So I assume in this case, 95% TAS. So what, when you go to GIS tests, what kind of, of tests do you usually perform? For the simple assessments of GIS circuit breakers, like various routine tests are conducted to ensure their basic functionality during commissioning and maintenance. This test includes checking the mechanical operations of the breaker, verifying the insulation integrity that is mostly performing during the commissioning time with AC insulation withstand test and measuring the important electrical parameters such as contact resistance measurement, then the contact time, multiple sequence are considered like closing time, opening time, close open time, open close open time. And we have one standard in the Middle East, mostly in GCC countries that we have to use two trip coils. I think this is the same uh, standards that everywhere is using. So we need to verify both trip coils, CO1, CO2, O1, O2. Yeah. So we verify yeah. both trip coils and also we need to measure the operational sequence of the circuit breaker. And here, most of the systems are OCO, open, close, open. And we verify these, the timing and the operation for, for the both coils. Again, the motor current with the starting current and running yeah. current is one of the, one of the parameter that we are measuring. At the same time, during the measurement, the coil currents are measuring. And we calculate the coil resistance as well. This is again part of the routine test. After that, the under voltage and over voltage test on the coils is very important. In case if the station batteries are not operating well, we still need to know whether the breaker will operate correctly or not. In in those under voltage and over voltage measurement, timing is not an important factor. At least we should know that the breakers are operating. So these are the electrical parameters. And after that, we have to test also the SF6 gas. We measure the dew point. It should be minus 35 degrees Celsius in the region. And the purity, it's a 98 percentage. And also we check SO2. SO2 is not mandatory with the purity and dew point we confirm. But SO2 sometimes it's requested so that we check SO2. It should be very, very, very less minute. And in the last, we also perform a leakage test. It's very interesting. Maybe I don't know if you have experience with the leakage test that we... No, cover. not at all. Yeah, it's it's an interesting test for GIS system. It's, I don't want to excel a lot, but I just give you how we perform this measurement that we wrap the every joints of the GIS system and then we keep it for 24 hours and then we have a gas leak detector. And after 24 hours, we make a hole and check in every joints on this supply yeah. cover. <laughs> And if this test is failed as a manufacturer, is a trouble for me because the tightening and rechecking the torque of the GIS is a big job. So uh, it's, it's a simple, but as well as it's an important test because we should ensure the SF6 pressure should not go down with the time. Yeah. So these are the uh, commissioning time or the routine test. But also I would like to explain you a lot, a, a little bit on the, the complex assessments. The first test help us Please. see circuit breaker in operating circuit breaker operations are within the specified parameters, and it we will check is operator capable of interrupting the force effectively. But in the complex assessment, mostly we perform during the maintenance time, so we do additional tests to evaluate the performance of the circuit breaker under different operating conditions and false scenarios we have to consider. So these tests we may involve the analyzing of the dynamic contact resistance measurement. So this is time to time. It's not always mandatory, but it's time to time uh, in the region it is measuring. And in every tender requirements from the utility, the circuit breaker testing device must have the capability to perform DRO. Uh, okay. And, yep. And motion analysis is also performed, but not a lot because of the little complexity in the mechanism of GIS. You need to remove the mechanism box and make the connection either into the mechanical indicator or some points inside the system. And most of the cases, utility people will not allow anyone to touch inside the mechanism box unless if there yeah. is like a major requirement to do an intensive analysis. 
or some overhauling is happened, then motion analysis become an important test. And during motion analysis, we check the travel and stroke. And further, also we do some advanced diagnostic techniques like a PD measurement. Now, PD measurement is mandatory for commissioning. During high voltage with voltage withstand tests, we perform a PD measurement using the UHF method. And sometimes they look for the infrared thermography or in, okay. in the extensions, vibration analysis. But it's not always there, but some uh, utility, they likes the vibration analysis to identify any potential issues or abnormalities in the breaker. And I would like to also tell you there are some maintenance utility because there are many tests, you know, depending upon every utility requirement, the people, the tests are different. And if I specify one utility in Dubai, in Diva, they do a very interesting maintenance as well in case if they would like to do an extended measurements, they perform the first trip test. Also, they use the capability of the VDS system. VDS is the voltage detection system to check the breaker condition breaker operations circuit breaker timing in live conditions nowadays with the technology there are testing devices which is capable to perform those measurements it is complicated due to the requirement of many permissions from the operation team you know that it's a live station okay it's not yeah, yeah. that easy to do a trip and close but we we did that we have supported diva and we performed the measurement and we see very interesting saying uh, sine, sine waves with such measurements and we know exactly how a current is dropping to zero with the live measurements. VDS, we measure the voltage, but the first trip that we measure the current from the CT secondary. And in the last further, some people also do a minimum pickup to verify the operation of the trip coil at what voltage is required, at the minimum voltage required to operate a coil. So those are the different tests that's usually performed <laughs> here. If you give me an opportunity also, we should also talk about the testing devices. Right, Stefan? Because you can also see some revolutions in the testing devices. Sure, but let me, I mean, usually I like to summarize, but to, to, to try to summarize that, you just kind of, you, you test everything. <laughs> <laughs> Every test that is available, you just throw it all there to get as much information out of the circuit breaker as humanly possible and just yeah. try to to kind of get as much information from it with any test that is available to, to know about the mechanics, about the context, et cetera, and just try to, to get a, a big, as big a picture as possible. Actually, before we go into testing devices, I'm, I'm interested in one aspect though. So first of all, you said it's, it's difficult to do live tests because of, of re the requirements from the utilities that you might not be able to, to switch. But on the yeah. other hand, you also said that you do the, the dynamic resistance measurement is kind of sometimes a prerequisite. So in yes. Europe, we usually, we don't like to really do dynamic resistance measurements on GIS because with the, the grounding has its, its challenges. You know, the, yep. the ground, you, you can't really distinguish as well between open and closed breaker yep. because the, the grounding mechanism, well, the, the, the grounding of the circuit breaker is actually the whole, the whole casing of the GIS. So you're in a micro ohm range and you can't really distinguish is it open, is it closed? You don't really see much. So I'm curious, how do you perform the dynamic resistance measurement on these GAS in the Middle East? Do you actually remove one of the grounding? And if yes, do you not have safety concerns of that? So how do you just walk me through that that process of how you do it and, and maybe why you require it and why you are, are willing to take certain risks just because you, you need to have that measurement? So this is mostly the requirements are recently from the medium voltage GIS systems. Also, such utilities are demanding for the high voltage system as a capability to perform the measurements. Point, it's very valid that in GIS systems, it's very important to keep both sides grounded, especially during the maintenance time while the other feeders are energized. For performing the DR measurement, yes, we are opening one ground one side of the grounding to access okay. the terminals and to perform proper measurements on the conducts so that we get some graphs, characteristics on the arcing conducts. The thing on the DRM is still the, the information, the knowledge that how to analyze the pattern are still there through a lot of webinars and seminars and the information around the, around the internet. 
the people started learning and understand the importance of those measurements. But so far, this is the way we are performing that we open one set ground and perf- check the measurements. Definitely, we measure the voltage with reference to the ground if it is in the safe limit or not. That is man. That okay. is, a, is an important point. But other than that, that was honestly, I have to say, the the methods always following in many years. One site open. Uh, we don't have that a lot of technologies to perform an act real a good measurements with both sides grounded in the GIS system. And uh, it's you already mentioned that the grounding in the GIS systems there are multiple grounding points, and that the uh, resistance of the path is almost same as the resistance of the main conductor. So the current can split. So we'll not get an actual measurement because of these reasons. And we need to do a measurement. It was opening. But luckily with the uh, new technologies and the availability of the the devices that can do a re- good measurements, accurate measurements with both is grounded. These years, from last two, three years, we are raising the safety concerns and asking the people to perform the measurements on, especially on, extra high voltage GIS 380K with GIS to do a timing measurement with both sides grounded. So that's a little bit of methods that we are performing. So mostly it's historical. It's always been done with a DRM with one side open yeah. kind of, I mean, it is the, the preferred test because you actually have a little bit more information in the DRM because you can actually see the resistance of the arcing contact, etc. But yes, especially in Europe, we have the safety concerns. So we kind of tried to use these new technologies that you already yeah, mentioned. Maybe let's get into these new technologies real quick. Maybe as a, as a, yeah, as a teaser, and we're planning to do the next episode and really focusing on the test devices and on where we are now. Also talking about the Sibano 500, of course, which is our test device. But if you want to get a little into it, why, what would you see has developed and, and what, what differentiates these new test systems from how they used to be and what advantages they have, please give, give us a little a little teaser already of, of what you wanted to say earlier. Yes, because, you know, the testing will not finish. We cannot complete the testing of a circuit breaker without a testing device, right? That, yes. that's, that's why I was very, you know, excited to talk about the testing devices also. When I am comparing with my initial experiences when I was working as a junior engineer, it's it's like a semi-automatic machines that we have to give a command manually and put, you know, somebody has to put the cables into the command points and then take the measurements. So it's, it's, it's not a really, you know, a professional way to do the measurements, but that was the, you know, the technology we have. Uh, but now with the latest in developments, you know, we have now, like you said, the Sibana 500, which has now the automatization capabilities which also, you know, giving excitement or, you know, feels the development in this electrical industry from the different engineers seeing that, you know, especially the senior engineers seeing that uh, a circuit breaker testing is doing everything automatic. You make one connection uh, and put all the templates, all the test requirements, multiple sequence, just push one time and everything is done automatically, you know, <laughs> even the motor charging, the, the status of the breaker, everything is checked. And then it's automatic executes one by one by one, one after other. And then in the end, you have a fully detailed report with the assessments if you enter those informations in the software. So which is something, an amazing way that we perform or how we are moving in this in this era, you know, with such technologies. And which helps both, you know, the, P, the, main, the engineers as well as reduces a lot of errors and for as well as helps in the easy analysis. And then, you know, we have this cloud platforms and you can simply synchronize to the cloud platforms, which help the maintenance or asset managers to see their assets and help them to do a proper maintenance decision. So it is something worth to mention it along with the testing. Awesome. So how would you assess, like in what time frame did that change happen from like the older devices to now where you really... You connect all the wires and then you just kind of press start and afterwards you get to report without any, any, or a lot of human interaction. Has that been in the last like 10, 20 years, really, right? That is, that has changed. I cannot say like 10, 20 years. I started my career 10 years back and 2017, I have seen mostly the semi-automatic testing machines. So from the 2017 and all, there are like, like many 
manufacturers trying to bring uh, a lot of latest inventions, technologies, and with the development of the power electronics, many things become yeah. capable. So let's say maybe last five years, okay. so that's kind of trends are happening in, around the world. That's cool. A cool time to be an electrical engineer. So any anything we didn't touch upon yet, anything you still would like to mention in regards to circuit breaker testing or the Middle East where or specifically to the Middle East, or maybe any advice to somebody that wants to get into circuit breaker testing but doesn't have as much experience as you yet and doesn't have all the, as you said, the the vision like a movie, what's happening in, in the mechanics in there. Do you have any advice or, or something that you would want to mention before we before we get to the end? That's, that's interesting, you know, <laughs> to give some suggestions and advices. You know, what, what most important is, these days, with the new engineers, with the present scenario, the power system is complex. We have to say that there is a lot. It's not one conventional power is uh, coming in the system. It has a lot of conventional and unconventional energy. It's a, it's a mix of systems. And with the development of the renewables and with the digitalization, the system becomes smart. And in, so... But the but you have to keep on analyzing and assessing your assets. That's because that's very important because you have like thousands and hundred thousands of assets which is still working in the conventional way. So you have to be known on both ways, like what is happening, what happened, or what was the technology before, and what is the technology just coming. And in all the cases, testing will be there. So the overall goal of for this testing is to keep it simple to ensure the reliability, safety, and efficient operations of circuit breakers and all other assets in even any condition to prevent any potential disruptions in the power grid. So that is the ultimate goal. So my advice is that to get try to get knowledge about all the technologies, all the measurement methods, what are the recommendations from the different parts of the regions or different parts of the world, and uh, try to get insights of all these different testing methodologies and how you can utilize these methodologies to analyze your assets. That can make, you know, a good resilient system. That's a perfect segue also into my last question that I usually ask since I have the honor of talking to people from around the world, really experts in, in power systems. I just want to, you know, with the, this world that we live in, where we talk about energy crisis and, and similar words all the time, I just want, I'm interested in, in how you would describe the resilience of the grids in your area. Do you feel, is it, are you up for the challenges ahead or, or is it a critical juncture? How would you assess the, the general uh, yeah, resilience of the grid in, in, in the Middle East? Maybe it's difficult to answer because it's so many different countries, but just some general thoughts on, on the topic. The resilience is very strong. You know, the resilience of the power grid in Middle East is is having some, you know, it's region's unique circumstances you have to consider. Yeah. Many countries in GCC Middle East has made substantial investments in the in, in making a resilient power infrastructure and to overcome the challenges which persist in certain areas. This again, you know, this rapid urbanization, population growth that recently observed in different parts of the Middle East. Cities are expanding and power demands are increasing. And yeah. the become requirement of a robust and reliable electrical systems to support the growing energy requirements. So yeah, this investments in the infrastructure upgrades, including the implementation of the modern technologies in the power grid, modern circuit breakers, we can say, <laughs> or the development of the digital stations getting more essential for enhancing the grid resilience and ensuring an un uninterrupted power supply. And we can say this extreme climate conditions that prevail in the Middle East, such as high temperatures and <laughs> let's say sandstorms, <laughs> is also challenges to the resilience of the power grid. But you know, our the electrical equipments which need to be designed. So we are very focused in the design of the the power system assets that is used in this kind of harsh environment conditions. And we can say the regular testing, maintenance, and timely upgrades. And the standards that the people, the utility in the Middle East that keeps for the maintenance of the critical and crucial assets, again, ensures the resilience and minimizes the, the risk of failures do, even during this extreme conditions. So overall, you know, the efforts are made and to enhance the resilience of the power grid in the Middle East. Again, you know, ongoing investments are there. 
we have addressed the power increase in the power demand and some in addressing the geopolitical situations and environmental challenges we have still still you know further strengthening the grid's ability to withstand any disruptions and and, and trying to ensure a reliable power supply for the regions growing energy needs that's awesome and and an amazing and and to the podcast saying that you can actually contribute to the resilience of the power grid by making sure your circuit breakers are tested and are all in a good state so that if challenges come up that you can actually control these challenges accordingly and that whatever you want to turn off actually turns off accordingly in the way you imagine. Thank you so much yeah. for this conversation and for your insights. This has been an amazing conversation and I learned a lot about how it works in the Middle East and, and what you do and why you do it. So thank you much, very much for taking your time and talking to me today. Thank you, Anas. Thank you, Stefan. I would really like to express my gratitude for providing this platform to discuss such an important topic, right? Just I want to also correct it for you for the... We, I think we just said that for 33 kV stations, SF6... So it's gear SF6 panels. I think they're also using the SF6 breakers so that some stations are the medium B breakers, but there are stations with the 33 gave SF6 breakers. I, I, in, in During the conversation, I felt like I have to say something not wrong, not right. So just want to highlight this point also. So again, you know, circuit breakers really play a critical role in ensuring the reliability, safety, and efficiency of the electrical network. And their proper testing and maintenance are paramount. Remember, yeah. the world of circuit breaker testing is ever evolving. And like we said, staying informed is the key to building a stronger and more resilient power infrastructure. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, we're looking forward to have such more interesting and insightful conversation. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Anas. Couldn't have said it any better. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our conversation and we want to thank you for listening to this episode of Energy Talks. We always welcome your questions and feedback. Simply send us an email to podcast at omicronenergy.com. Omicron has several years of experience in power system testing and offers you the matching solutions for your application. This includes devices for testing circuit breakers, which were the topic of this conversation. For more information, be sure to visit our website at omicronenergy.com and please join us to listen to the next episode of Energy Talks. Goodbye for now, everyone. Mm-hmm.